Hey everyone, welcome back to the latest edition of The Week in Charts, the show where I take you on a tour of markets and run through the most interesting charts and themes that are going on today. Of course, we have to start out this week with First Republic. Shouldn't be a surprise to anyone watching this show on a regular basis because we've been talking about First Republic for some time now. It's been the weakest stock in the regional bank sector. And after reporting earnings, its stock really collapsed last week and it ended the day on Friday uh, with very little in terms of market cap left. So you're looking at just a few months ago, this is a bank that was worth over $20 billion in terms of market uh, value. And that dropped to below a billion dollars uh, last Friday. And what was going on here? Just the classic run on the bank. Uh, the too many people are leaving the bank. So over a hundred billion dollars in terms of deposits moving out of the bank. If we're not including that $30 billion infusion from the big banks uh, and First Republic's paying more uh, for their borrowing costs and that net interest margins falling. And this is not a situation that can go on for very long. And indeed it didn't uh, Monday morning, the, they announced that JP Morgan Chase would be taking over all of the deposits. So all the depositors, once again, will be made whole. And uh, what you see here is just the big banks, once again, getting bigger, that notion too big to fail. Uh, it really continues here because uh, we're seeing that the bank that was already the biggest bank in the US uh, get now even bigger. So if we look at uh, the uninsured deposits, uh, this is a surprise to me that it was actually this high, 19.8 billion at the end of the first qu quarter. So apparently uh, it wasn't enough uh, in terms of the uh, scare from Silicon Valley Bank and Signature, Signature Bank, and maybe because the depositors ultimately uh, were unharmed there, uh, you still had this many deposits uh, in terms of being uninsured. Well, they're all safe, uh, including that, of course, 30 billion from the other banks as well. Everybody in terms of the depositors walks away 100% whole. So how big is First Republic bank failure on a scale of U US bank failures in history? How do we put that in context? Well, it passed Silicon Valley Bank to become the second largest bank failure in US history. So pretty, pretty sizable uh, bank here. And now you have the second, third and fourth largest bank failures in history occurring just in the last two months. So pretty significant, not a lot of banks failing, but the ones that have failed pretty sizable. And then just to give you some perspective here from 2009 through 2022, you had 511 bank failures in the U S and the total assets of those banks was 339 billion. And just in the last two months, we've had three banks fail. So not a huge number, obviously compared to 511. Uh, but the total assets of those significantly higher at 548 billion. So pretty significant here, three banks failed so far, all the depositors again made are made whole. Uh, but of course that's going to cost uh, somebody money and it's costing the deposit insurance fund uh, an estimated here over 30 billion in terms of total uh, losses here to the fund. So you have First Republic Bank, the estimate is 13 billion. That's a little bit less than Silicon Valley Bank. So it's gonna put a dent in that deposit insurance fund, uh, which was 128 billion entering the year. And what they're talking about is raising the rates in terms of what banks have to pay. Uh, they're going to be assessed higher rates in order to replenish this fund uh, going forward. So uh, it's pretty interesting thus far, we still have this situation where there's no explicit guarantee uh, in terms of these smaller banks, if some someone fails, uh, we still have that comment from Janet Yellen saying if there's a bank that causes systemic risk, the depositors would be made whole. But uh, there's still that question mark. So the question remains out there, is there going to be another bank in the next few months or the next year uh, that becomes uh, similar to First Republic? And do they have a similar outcome here where all depositors are made whole? That remains to be seen. But if we look at the uh, price action here in terms of S&P, uh, pretty interesting, really unfazed by the First Republic move. During the Silicon ba Valley bank failure, you saw a little dip in the S&P, came right back. But here, S&P rallying uh, into the close on Friday. JP Morgan Chase uh, seeing a little bit of a bump in its stock today. This doesn't, isn't reflected in this chart, uh, but 
obviously doing well in the year. So investors not assuming this is going to be a bank crisis that hits the bigger banks. Indeed, they're saying they're actually going to benefit uh, from perhaps buying these assets on the cheap. Uh, and, and interesting in terms of the regional bank ETF, uh, as First Republic was uh, declining really rapidly on Friday, you were seeing the regional bank ETF actually move higher. And it's kind of just gone sideways here over the past month or so. And so you're not seeing a, a broader in terms of the declines, you're not seeing a broadening of this in terms of investor risk expectation. So we'll see, perhaps it's going to be just limited here, or perhaps uh, we just haven't seen it yet. And as more uh, banks reveal the deposit outflows and, and different situations in terms of commercial real estate and what the pressures that's going to put on these banks, Will we see more in the coming weeks and months? That's going to be the big question. But again, in terms of the broader market, really not only shrugging it off, but acting extremely complacent. If we look at the VIX, the volatility index, almost shocking, you have a second largest bank failure in history, and the VIX is at its lowest level since November 2021. So VIX closes below 16, uh, and we haven't seen these levels since November 2021. And the historical average is around 19 and a half, so well below that average. So very quickly, the markets have become extremely calm and complacent and perhaps saying that's going to be the end of it uh, or perhaps has become too complacent. So if we talk about what that impact of First Republic in terms of Fed policy, what are the markets expecting? Well, once again, interesting surprise, similar to the expectations after First Republic very quickly the market uh, recovered in terms of the S&P and very quickly uh, investor expectations expected another hike after that failure. And they're indeed expecting another hike here today. Uh, so the Fed meets again this week and the market saying pretty high probability here, 89% chance Fed's going to do that 25 basis point hike to push that Fed funds rate above 5%. That would be the first time the Fed funds rate is above 5% since September 2007 and interesting that september 2007 was right near when we had the last major banking crisis but nevertheless market is expecting the fed to keep pushing higher in terms of interest rates and so the really what the market's saying is inflation here is still the bigger concern for the federal reserve even though you have these huge bank failures and that will likely lead to a decline in lending and a decline in economic activity. Still the bigger concern the market's saying is inflation. So the Fed has to do one more hike here. But after that, this is where you have this real divergence here. And you have a lot of people arguing about what's actually gonna happen. But what the market is expecting again is that this will be the last hike. So uh, unless the Fed's language indicates otherwise, and we'll see what they say, there's gonna be a lot of attention in terms of the press conference and the signaling uh, from the statement, but the market's saying this is the last hike of the cycle. Uh, and then the Fed's gonna pause for a few months. And in September, the Fed's gonna start cutting rates and they're going to keep cutting interest rates uh, throughout the uh, rest of the year into 2024. And we're gonna see a Fed funds rate below 3% by the end of 2024. And as we've said a million times, uh, this is, Take it with a grain of salt because these expectations change on a daily basis. They can change significantly depending on what the Fed says one day or another day and depending on economic data, depending on obviously inflation data. Uh, but it's interesting to see that the market's saying we're getting close uh, to the end of that hiking cycle. And perhaps that's why the markets have been responding so well uh, so far this year in the face of a lot of bad news. Perhaps they're pretty happy uh, that the Fed seems to be closer to the point where they have inflation under control. At least that's the current expectation. And if we look at the Fed's balance sheet, really, they continue to normalize. So following uh, Silicon Valley Bank failure, we had this huge spike in terms of assets. And most of that was loans. Uh, and over the last five weeks, we've seen a real moderation here. So I continue to watch this week by week. We'll see what happens with the First Republic uh, failure, if that changes anything. But First Republic was one of the banks that had a huge amount of loans uh, from the Federal Reserve's uh, facility. So uh, perhaps this will even go down more. So we're gonna watch this pretty closely, but this seems to me 
uh, to indicate that the Fed for now is not uh, seeing that same type of emergency that we saw there for a brief period uh, back in March. So watch this pretty closely. Again, the Fed wants to normalize this balance sheet still incredibly high. They wanted this to be down uh, this year. It's still actually up year to date in terms of assets. They want to see this run off and normalize. Uh, so we'll see again in terms of their statement uh, this week if they have any commentary about their balance sheet. But what's been going on, the broader macro theme, uh, pretty much consistent throughout the past few months. And really that is reversing the excesses uh, that we had in 2020 and 2021 in terms of the money, money supply just exploding higher. So we had that crazy situation where we had this huge, enormous, unprecedented increase in the money supply. Uh, we have 40% increase in just two years, 2020 and 2021. And now we've seen just this 180 degree reversal where on a year over year basis, money supply is actually now down 4%. That's the biggest decline on record with data going back to 1960. So as we talked about on the way up, money supply increases this much. It's always been a leading indicator of higher inflation rates. Indeed, that's what we saw. And with money supply going down, the expectation, at least in my view, would be we're going to see a continued decline in that inflation rate. If we look at it on a year to date basis, we're already on pace for the biggest decline that we've seen with data going back here to 1959 in terms of the money supply. So uh, this is a positive trend in my view, because this was an excess that needed to be reversed. Of course, there's been some pain in terms of markets. Uh, there's been some pain in terms of the economy and uh, may be more pain to come, but this is a necessary uh, amount of pain that you need to have in order to bring down this inflation spike highest inflation we've seen since the early 1980s. So we got another data point on that front, PCE index, which is something the Fed looks at very closely. And if we look at that overall PCE index, another decline here down to 4%, still above that historical average last 20 years, around 2%. But the, again, the expectation is as we get into the summer, we get to that period, May and June, where we had that huge increase last year in terms of commodity prices, you're going to see better comps uh, and this will continue to come down over the next few months, absent uh, some type of spike that's unexpected. So I think you're going to see a continued uh, trend down in terms of this inflation rate. And I guess the market's betting, at least in part, that the Fed's going to be looking at this and saying we have enough data at this point to pause. Now we have a Fed's funds rate above the uh, PCE inflation rate, above the CPI inflation rate. That should be enough to at least reassess and pause. We'll see what they say, but that seems to be the market expectation. And if we look at the big factor, the biggest factor in terms of CPI, in terms of inflation, of course, it's housing. That's the uh, number one uh, category that people spend money on, most households. Uh, if you look at CPI, it's 34% of that index. And what we have here is continued slowdown in terms of home prices. That's not yet being reflected in the CPI. So we have now, Case Shiller, Shiller data through February, 2% year over year increase. That's the slowest rate of increase we've seen in a long time. And remember, this is as of February, it's lagging by a few months. If we look at the Redfin real time data, we're down 2.8% year over year. That's the biggest year over year declines we've seen in the housing market. You have to go back to 2012. So, Good sign there. If you're looking for a head in terms of CPI, again, we've talked about this lag between uh, housing data in, in terms of CPI and housing data in terms of the actual data. There's a lag there and we're getting closer to the point where housing data and CPI starts to reflect that and turnover at least slows down and perhaps later this year starts to turn negative. So if we look at the 20 city index is something I look, like to look at every single month. And we're seeing more cities here in this index down on a year over year basis. So now we have eight, 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 eight out of the 20 cities down on a year over year basis. A lot of them uh, looks like West Coast cities for now. Uh, the uh, cities uh, in uh, Florida still seeing pretty strong year over year growth. You just have huge demand there. A lot of uh, movement from New York, New Jersey. Uh, other areas down to Florida driving that, but everywhere is seeing a slowdown. So every single city 
peaked back in 2022 and is seeing a decline uh, from its all-time high. And I suspect in the next few months, we're going to see more and more cities turn down year over year in terms of home prices. So if we're looking at rents, uh, again, this is another another huge factor in terms of CPI. Uh, and this is at odds with the CPI data, which we continue to see year over year CPI show increases. But the actual rental data is showing decreases in the rate of inflation won't down to 1.7%. So now below the historical average. And what we're seeing here is just a continued rise in rate vacancy rates, which should mean we're going to see this year over year change in rents continue to decline in the coming months. And I think we could see actually a negative year over year print here at some point uh, in the next few months. So good news on the inflation front. Biggest factor by far is the housing, uh, housing factor and that housing factor in terms of prices, in terms of rents is going lower. Now, what we're seeing in terms of housing activity, this is pretty fascinating, is this is driving uh, lumber costs to go way down. So if you remember in 2020 and 2021, we had this just enormous increase in the price of lumber. There's many factors driving that. Part of it was supply. Part of it was demand in terms of we had this just huge housing boom. So nevertheless, we saw lumber futures just explode higher. And now we've really given back all of that, those increases, 80% decline from the peak in 2021. So if you look at lumber prices compared to where they were in the last decade and where they are today, not exceedingly high. So this shouldn't come as a surprise in terms of housing activity because we've seen a collapse in housing starts over the past year. We've talked about this 17% year over year of decline, 11 straight a decline monthly decline on a year over year basis. So you have a lower input cost, but you still have people, there's still demand for new homes. Uh, and so as we've talked about, this is helping home builders help helping home construction, uh, because their, their margins are being helped by that lower input uh, input cost, but they're still, uh, selling, uh, homes. Uh, apparently they haven't cut them as much and the market's pricing that in and giving home construction ETF here up over 30% in the past year versus a 1% gain for the S&P 500. So very interesting to see that given the huge decline in housing activity, you have this expectation that there's going to be a huge increase in terms of home construction in the coming years with the home builders uh, exceeding the market by a huge margin. So. If we look at the housing market overall in terms of activity for uh, new homes, but particularly existing homes, what we've seen is a market that's been in a standstill. And if we look at pending home sales here, uh, that's expected to continue. So pending home sale index just looks at contracts, contracts that were signed. So after a contract for a house is signed, you're looking at a few months on average before it closes. So this tends to be a leading indicator of uh, existing home sales. And so what we saw here, once again, another year over year decline, 22nd consecutive year over year decline. And we're seeing this across the country. So in all 50 of the most populous US metropolitan areas, they're, they're declining. You have big declines in Las Vegas, Seattle, Portland, uh, Oakland, California. So what we're seeing here is a housing market where activity has really plummeted. And this is really the big reason other than affordability that that's, that's happened is that, uh, you have just so many people that are in mortgage rates that are much lower than today. So if we look at the overall percentage of people, uh, that have mortgages and what they're, what the rate that they're paying on those mortgages is, uh, over 70% are paying 4% or less. So vast majority of people have mortgages either for refinancing or they bought homes in 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, when mortgage rates were at these record low rates, uh, and they have mortgage rates very low. And the, uh, the narrative is that these people don't want to sell their home because if they were, were to sell their home now and get a new mortgage and in a new house, they wouldn't be able to afford that house because the mortgage rate obviously would be much higher. We're looking at mortgage rates today at 6.4%. So what this has led to is just very few homes out there for sale. 
And that has really, I guess, supported in some way housing, how the housing market. We haven't seen prices come down rapidly. We've seen them come down, but not rapidly. And that's, uh, that's likely because we're just not seeing enough uh, in terms of supply out there. And there's still some demand. You have an increase in cash buyers. You have other factors still driving uh, some home sales. But I guess it, it, this isn't to say that home prices won't come down, but I guess it's just slowing the pace uh, of, of these declines because people uh, are in the situation where they, it, they, if they were to sell their house, they couldn't buy a new house. Uh, because at the same uh, monthly mortgage payment, because interest rates have gone up so much. So it's pretty interesting. You have this back and forth uh, going on where people saying, well, this, this is the reason why housing uh, prices won't go down. But at the same time, if you think about it, uh, it means that housing prices are really unaffordable because you're saying that people aren't going to sell their home because they couldn't afford a new one. So for most people who bought homes in the last few years, if they had to buy that same home today, they couldn't afford them based on two factors. One, the price of the home has gone up so much. And number two, the mortgage rate has gone so much, gone up so much. So interesting uh, that people are saying, well, uh, in the, on the one hand, homes <laughs> are not affordable, but uh, two, that's a reason why uh, that home prices won't come down. So pretty interesting to see that disconnect and we'll see how it's resolved. But if we look at the number one reason people are still renting, so people renting and they're not buying a home, this is probably not surprising, but number one reason is unaffordability. And if we just look at the data, we just look at the numbers, it's really obvious uh, how unaffordable uh, things have become versus just a few years ago. So three years ago, you have a 30 year mortgage rate at below th uh, 3%. The average new home price in the U.S. is 360000 Today, the 30-year mortgage rate is more than double that rate from three years ago. And you have a significant increase in the average new home price at 562000 And if we just take those numbers and say, well, what would you need in terms of a down payment today versus three years ago? And what does your monthly payment look at look like today versus three years ago? It's just night and day. So $40,000 increase in your down payment necessary because of that increase in the home price and 132 percent increase in the monthly payment uh, due to that increase in the home price and the huge increase in the mortgage rate so that's pretty much unaffordable for most people so that's the number one reason that people uh, who are renting uh, that's why they're renting instead of buying a home they can't afford to live there or they can't save enough money for the down payment. So that explains a lot of it. And if we look at, this is an interesting uh, data point out of apartment list, uh, home ownership rates versus uh, uh, compared to uh, different generations. So you have millennial, Gen X, baby boomer, silent generation. And you can see here, millennials really lagging uh, other generations at the age of 30. Uh, in terms of their home ownership rates, much, much lower. There's a number of different factors driving this financial crisis, you know, hit the millennials very hard. You had that last housing bubble. Uh, but today it's really unaffordability uh, driving that. And interestingly, you see an increasing number of these millennials saying that they're giving up on home ownership and they're planning to always rent instead of buy. So pretty interesting to see this. But this is not going on everywhere. This isn't the case everywhere. It's really divide between areas that are affordable based on people's incomes and areas that are not. So if we look at, in particularly the Midwest, if we look at Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio here, you have much higher uh, home ownership rates uh, that, than you're seeing in terms of New York and California. So areas that are still affordable for millennials, it's not that millennials don't want to own homes, it's that the twin housing price bubbles that we've seen in the past 20 years have really driven them out of the market in a lot of cases. So uh, how do you resolve this? Well, we've talked about it. The quickest way to resolve it is, of course, for prices to come down. It's very hard uh, for incomes to show the type of appreciation that we've seen in terms of the housing market. We showed that comparison uh, from three years ago. You have that monthly payment going up over 100%. Well incomes needless to say are not going up 100 percent in three years and so you either have home prices need to come down mortgage rates need to come down or you need people's incomes to just go up and if you wait for them to go up 
let's say three, four or 5% a year, it's going to take a long time, even if home prices don't go anywhere uh, to make those homes affordable. So we'll see how this plays out. But I thought that was an interesting data point and analysis in terms of different generations and why people, uh, the millennial generation is, is uh, buying homes at a slower pace than a uh, previous generation. So uh, speaking of of housing and this is something we haven't heard uh, probably in, uh, since the last housing bubble collapses investors increasingly are selling uh, their homes that they've bought for an investment at a loss and just to give you some perspective here what uh, percentage of the housing market uh, in terms of listings are is owned by investors we're at 10 percent currently which is uh, much higher than the historical rate. It's actually down from the peak that was over 12%. Uh, and if we look at uh, 2021 peak here, uh, we had just this explosion in demand from investors uh, during the recent housing bubble, uh, pushing uh, record rates of, of ownership from investors. That's come down a little bit, but still pretty high at 10%, still significantly higher than we were a decade ago, which was below uh, 4%. Then if we look at the percentage of investors in terms of home sales, so Redfin did this analysis, what percentage of investors are taking a loss uh, when they sell a home? Uh, and still not very high, but uh, noticeably increasing here. Now you're at uh, roughly one in seven homes sold in March were sold at a loss. Uh, and as you can see here, um, we're coming off a record low in terms of, of course, home prices were only going up for a decade. Uh, straight. So very few investors were taking a loss. And now that's just starting to change here with home prices coming down again. But as you can see here from this chart, we're nowhere near where we were in terms of the last uh, collapse in the housing bubble. So if prices continue to decline, you're going to see more and more investors taking a loss. And we're already starting to see that in many of the pandemic boom towns. So areas like Phoenix, that show, saw this huge appreciation in home prices, but now we're seeing uh, the opposite, where prices going down more rapidly, uh, and you're seeing a higher percentage in these areas of investors taking a loss. You're at 30, 31% in March in terms of Phoenix. So that's the highest of any major metro area. So we to continue to watch this. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Now, in terms of uh, selling for a loss, the office market in San Francisco, is just completely collapsing and for good reason the fundamentals there are just terrible <laughs> so you almost have 30 percent uh vacancy rates in san francisco and you can see the chart here it just continues to go up here and that's hitting rents i would have thought it would have hit, hit more but uh there was this article here in the wall street journal that was talking about an office uh property and uh that was uh for sale and they're expecting it to sell uh, there was very few uh, bidders for this property, but they're expecting it to sell at an 80% discount. So uh, just incredible uh, decline in value. And obviously, if you don't have that cash flow, you don't have that income from that property and cost and expenses and everything else have gone up, well, the value of that property is going to plummet. So this is going to be, I think, a continued story we're going to see throughout the country, particularly in these big major metropolitan areas where people have not come back to work. You have this increase in vacancies and uh, that's uh, at the same time, you have these record valuations in terms of commercial real estate. Well, something doesn't add up and you're going to see likely, I think declines continue there for some period of time. So uh, let's talk about earnings. Uh, and so far, I think it's been a story of beating low expectations so the market has responded pretty well i'd say to earnings so far We're almost uh with 50 percent of companies reported so 44 percent uh we have another down quarter for s p 500 earnings year over year so you're not seeing yet uh, uh in, in terms of uh at least earnings you're not seeing an increase year over year yet but I think the market's looking ahead and saying perhaps we're going to see that in the next few quarters but if we look at the major uh, companies, major tech companies, biggest part of the S and P 500. Um, you look at Google, still pretty slow growth, 2.6 percent. The market again didn't didn't really hit the stock very hard. Uh, you know, so, you know, I guess the expectation is things are going to be better. Perhaps uh, 
this was priced in uh, in terms of the declines from last year. Microsoft was a little bit better in terms of revenue, 7%. Net income actually grew at Microsoft, which was a little bit different than the S&P and many of these other tech companies. At Amazon, flipping back to a profit, up 9% year over year in terms of revenue. But if you look at Amazon historically, always grown uh, much faster than that. Uh, AWS just continues to grow. Crazy stat, $83 billion. Uh, in terms of uh, trailing 12 month uh, revenue for AWS, that's bigger than the revenue at 460 companies in the S&P 500. So if AWS was a standalone company uh, in terms of revenues, at least it would be one of the biggest, likely one of the biggest 40 companies in the US uh, by itself. So just tremendous, tremendous growth over the past decade. Question is, is this slowing? Yes, it is slowing, but still, uh, increasing. It's still a big driver for Amazon. If we look at uh, Facebook, which is now known as Meta, uh, it flipped to a positive revenue growth number, beat expectations. Uh, again, expectations were very low. Facebook got, stock had gotten crushed last year. It's actually now doubled this year, so up 100% on the year, uh, even with net income going down 24% over the year at last year and margins uh, compressing. So Again, market saying future is going to be better here. Uh, and interesting, Reality Labs continues to be a huge cost center for Facebook. Total loss now from this Reality Labs division, $30 billion uh, since they started breaking this out in the fourth quarter of 2020. So just massive loss. Just shows you how much cash flow a company like face Facebook had to, to be able to lose $30 billion dollars. Uh, in this reality labs division. Of course, they're making the bet that this is going to be a big part of the future. It's going to eventually pay off. But uh, the question, I guess, would be, did they bet on the wrong horse? And perhaps they should have put uh, uh, this money into AI. If you look at the investments that Microsoft has made in open AI, the last round was $10 billion. Uh, you wonder if Facebook would have done similar investments. Uh, would, have they, would they have been in a better position? It seems uh, to be the case, but I guess... We'll find out in the years to come. So overall, earnings better than expected. The market is thinking that that will continue throughout the year. If it's not, that's going to be a headwind. Uh, but I guess uh, the market is saying that uh, the declines that we saw in the stocks last year was overdone. It was short term. We're going to see like, maybe a reacceleration in terms of revenues and profits uh, for the remainder of this year. So economic growth, we got first quarter GDP. Uh, pretty much came in as expected, a little bit below if we look at the consensus estimates. But if we look at the Atlanta Fed uh, GDP now prediction, it was pretty much spot on. Uh, and what we're seeing here is just uh, slower growth, 1.6% year over year. Uh, the historical average over the last 20 years is around 2%, so a little bit below that. And the recession question just is still out there. It's still lingering. We have all of these leading indicators pointing to a recession. But not quite there just yet. And the latest indicator that I'm going to be looking at closely with the jobs report that's coming out this week will be temp jobs. Historically, temp jobs have turned down ahead of the overall uh, non-farm payrolls. And we're seeing already a year over year decline here. And we saw that in the last few recessions, temp jobs turned down before uh, the overall jobs market was a leading indicator. So we'll see on Friday, if that trend continues, uh, the expectation is more payroll growth that, that we're still, there's still a shortage of, of workers and companies are going to continue their hiring. But looking at the rate of change, it seems to be a slowdown uh, coming ahead. And so once again, we have all these indicators pointing to it, but we don't know when it's going to actually happen. And the overall question for the stock market, of course, is is has this recession already been priced in? Everyone's already forecasting it, talking about it. Uh, and that question uh, really can't be answered. We'll have to see when that data comes out, really pointing to that recession, how the market reacts to it. So let's end with something positive. And that's been the markets this year. And it's really been an inverse of 2022 in every way. If we look at 2022, you could just see here, a sea of red. So pretty much everything was down last year with the exception of commodities. And that wasn't good for most people because that meant higher inflation. This year, 
everything up except for commodities. So we actually have lower commodity prices if you're looking at gasoline and crude oil and a number of other commodities and people are pretty happy about that and everything else other than commodities is higher looking at tech stocks big rebound up over 20 percent that's more than double the gains for the s p 500 you have international developed markets outperforming this year you have gold doing well you have bonds doing well especially on the long end with interest rates long-term interest rates falling so Almost everything participating, that 60-40 portfolio that everyone was saying was dead last year, doing pretty well this year. And so first four months, pretty good uh, in terms of uh, returns for a diversified portfolio. And so if you're an investor that stuck with uh, your portfolio last year or added to your portfolio on that weakness, you're feeling pretty good right now. So let's end it right there. Thanks everyone for joining me. Have a great week. If you like the content, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time.